we're maturing. <laughs> we're understanding sequence. Amen. We want to acknowledge our speaker for today. And he comes to us as one who has served in this conference and specifically as bivocational pastor of this church. But let's talk about what he is currently involved in or his current assignment. Now, Mark Howard is an ordained minister of the Seventh Day Adventist Church with over 20 years of experience. He currently serves as the Associate Director for the Sabbath School and Personal Ministries Department for the Michigan Conference, as well as Director of the Emanuel Institute for Evangelism, or of Evangelism. He has served as pastor in the Michigan Conference since 2003, training people in soul winning and evangelism throughout his ministry. He continues to work with the General Conference as part of the GROW team developing such wonderful resources as the Discipleship Handbook, Fundamentals of Faith, and the soon-to-be-released Personal Soul-Winning Guide, Share the Word. He also serves on the Lake Union Conference Executive Committee. He is known for his clear teaching style and his commitment to the Adventist message. He and his wife of 34 years have served together in ministry for nearly 25 of those years, and they have two children, Caleb and Annalise, and look forward with hope to the soon return of Christ. I, I want to sp specifically address the fact that we ask Pastor Howard uh, to be with us today for two very foundational reasons. Number one, when reconstructing a congregation, it's best to reach out to those pastors who had the most significant and substantive congregation, I mean, contribution rather to the congregation. And we felt that that certainly took place through the ministries of Pastor Mark and Jim Howard. And so we're grateful that Pastor Mark Howard is here. Uh, we look forward to having Pastor Jim here with us. We will begin that process as well and hope for the best. And uh, we recognize that the church Almost, I hear you. Uh, we have to recognize that Fredericktown has had numerous pastors like any congregation. And those pastors, indeed, through the, in the times we live in, they kind of span the, uh, I guess you would say, the, um, the spectrum of perspectives, beliefs, and values. Uh, but it's best to get back to the bedrock of who we are as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. And so to that end, we ask him to be with us. After Brother Ron has given us our meditational number, Pastor Howard will bring the message of the morning. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the save the lord jesus jesus how i trust him how i prove him more and more jesus jesus Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee, precious Jesus. The Savior and friend, and I know that. 
that thou art with me will be with me till the end Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I prove him more and more Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I prove him more and more Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace oh for grace oh for grace to trust him more. Amen. All right, now I'm going to ask if you would bear with me just a moment while I get this hooked up, and, and here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'd like you to stand up, be reverent about it. We are in the sanctuary, but go ahead and stand. And smile, and turn to the person next to you, and say, this is going to be a long sermon. <laughs> no, just greet them warmly. And uh, yeah, somebody said they expected that. Make sure you greet them warmly, and then you can be seated. So is my mic on? Is this mic on? Are we hearing that yet? Okay, they're working. It's getting going that direction. And I, we're getting close here, I think. It is always a little surreal coming back here to Fredericktown. <laughs> that is me right here in the year 2000. This was my first pastorate as a lay pastor. They were bivocational. We called them bivocational pastors in those days. I look around the church and, and the church itself. Um, here's Chris. Chris, you remember putting these speakers up? They were white when we put them up <laughs> 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, let me say this, by the way. Anything that I did in this church can be removed, moved, taken away. You know how it gets sometimes in church. It's just like, oh, you can't move that because that's so-and-so who -so needed that. And you had to keep that there because that, and then the next thing you know, you can't do anything different with this. Is this not working? It's not working. <laughs> Where's the lapel at? Technical difficulties. here all right well you know I can always use a handheld if you would like they're handheld oh there we go uh, we got something coming on oh there we go now so you in the back didn't hear a thing I said you just heard me saw me moving my lips up here it's all right I don't know that you missed anything super important so anyway I started my pastoral ministry here in this church I see a lot of friends in this church who were here at that time. I see others who are visiting, but I've met through the years. I see new faces, and I'm glad to see those. I'm glad to be with the people of God in the house of God on the Sabbath. And uh, when I was invited to come here, uh, I've been back many times to Fredericktown. Um, my wife and I talk about it often. It was probably the brightest spot in our experience in all my pastoral years. It just was a... And not because, and I appreciate uh, 
Pastor Thomas's introduction. Incidentally, I was reminded I need to update my bio. My wife and I have been married for 36 years now. As uh, Brother Russell shared this morning, we all have that expiration date. If the Lord doesn't come, we're not getting younger. But uh, we did have a special time here, and it's not because of the man in front of you, but what the Lord was doing. And it's the same God who's still in charge, and he's still doing amazing things. And I hope to be in that generation, and I firmly believe that we are, that I have the privilege of seeing him coming in the clouds of glory. So I want to talk to you about that today, but I want to talk about that in the context of, I want to say Seventh-day Adventist history, but not so much. I'm not going to go into a lot of history, but I do have to say, you know, when you're invited in an Adventist church, your first church, incidentally, to speak on October 22, you can't not talk about the sanctuary. There are more reasons than that to talk about the sanctuary, but today, I, and incidentally, uh, Yolanda, I was doing the math, and I had 179 years, but that includes the year 1844. So it's either 178 or 179 years since what Seventh-day Adventists call the Great Disappointment. And so what I've entitled the message today is the Magnificent Disappointment, because the disappointment to the founders of what would become the Seventh-day Adventist Church became one of the brightest spots, or should be one of the brightest spots in the experience of God's people. The message of the sanctuary is a message that we have not nearly appreciated as we could or should. And so by God's grace, in the sermon I give today, and let me just clarify that, I'm giving one sermon today. Half of it before lunch, half of it after lunch. <laughs> you want to do one of those you know, duck out and dodge out after the lunch or whatever else, you're just going to miss the sermon. You're going to get this set up, and then you're going to miss the real good part. So it's like when I do an evangelistic meeting. I like to tell the guests, if there's any night I would have missed, it would have been tonight. Because everything else just gets better. So if I would have missed anything, I would have missed this morning. Don't miss this afternoon, whatever you do. I shouldn't have to tell you that because it's Sabbath all day, right? But before we go any further, I want to pray and ask God to bless our time in his word. I want to invite you to bow your heads while I do that. O oh, merciful and gracious Heavenly Father, what a privilege we have to be here in this house of worship looking back on that date, October 22, 1844. What a privilege we have to have inherited such a holy and noble faith. Not by anything that we have done to deserve it. And Lord Jesus, I pray you will help us to prove faithful to our trust. We are living in the generation that will see Jesus come. And you have given us a work to prepare the world for that coming. Help us again, Lord, to be found faithful. Bless us this morning and this afternoon. May your spirit give us ears to hear and hearts to respond. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now, I do want to briefly review a couple things about our history. The Advent movement, the Adventist church, grew out of what we call the Great Second Advent movement. And in that Great Second Advent movement, people from all denominations began to study the scriptures as they hadn't studied them before. And maybe I should clarify, one of the reasons they hadn't studied them that way before is because the Lord had said that the book of Daniel would be sealed up until the time of the end. And when the time of the end came, like clockwork, the understanding of God's people across denominational lines was opened up, and as they began to study the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, new light came. Now that early group of believers, as they studied Daniel 8.14, our scripture reading, they concluded that the sanctuary was to be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days. That's what it says in Daniel 8.14. They concluded that the 2300 days would end in the year 1844. They believed that the cleansing of the sanctuary was a reference to the Jewish Day of Atonement. They went back in the Bible and looked at the typology. We're going to look at that a little bit today. According to the most reliable Jewish calendars, the Day of Atonement in the year 1844 would fall on October 22, and thus... One more piece. 
The sanctuary, their understanding, incidentally, so you know this, this was a common understanding of Christianity at large. Sometimes people point back to the Advent movement and said, well, why did they think the sanctuary was the earth? Ironically, it's the one thing they didn't study out from scripture. They just took everybody's say so on it and concluded the sanctuary referred to this earth. And then if it was going to be cleansed, that must be cleansed by fire at the second coming of Jesus. And therefore they concluded Jesus would return to this earth on October 22, 1844. In fact, we, in the book, Great Controversy, Ellen White tells us in common with the rest of the Christian world, Adventists then held that the earth or some portion of it was the sanctuary. They understood that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the purification of the earth by the fires of the last great day and that this would take place at the second advent. Hence the conclusion that Christ would return to the earth in 1844. Needless to say, this did not happen as they expected. And so we have come to know the day of October 22 as the great disappointment. Some say it should be October 23 because October 22 passed before the disappointment really settled in. But the fact is October 22 did not happen as they expected. Did not mean nothing happened on October 22. It simply means that they didn't understand what was going on. Little did they realize that their disappointment would lead to the full assurance of hope the Apostle Paul speaks of in Hebrews chapter 6 for future believers that we're going to be looking at more this afternoon. But I want to take some time this morning to look at the subject of the sanctuary. Now, I will tell you, in my experience as a Seventh-day Adventist minister, this is just not a subject that a lot of Adventists find inspirational. Now, I hope I'm preaching to the choir here today, but the reality is that there are many Adventist pulpits you won't hear sermons that talk about the sanctuary. If you go to an Adventist seminary, you're probably not going to hear as much about the sanctuary. And what you do hear, well, I don't even want to get into all that. But let me say this. The subject of the sanctuary, we're told in inspiration, is one of the most important subjects we can understand. Go to the book Great Controversy with me on the screen, page 488. The subject of the sanctuary in the investigative judgment. Notice it doesn't say subject, subject. There's one. These things are together. Should be what? Clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge for themselves of the what? Position, Position and work of their great high priest. Don't miss this. We're going to unpack this. When we talk about the sanctuary, too often as Seventh-day Adventists, we get into discussions about furniture and tent coverings. But inspiration tells us that the subject of the sanctuary and investigative judgment are about the position and work of our great high priest. Do you understand that other denominations do not have an answer for what Jesus did after he went to heaven? They'll boast up and down, and I've heard Adventists do it these days, boast up and down about how everything was finished at the cross. What are we waiting on? Why are we still here? I start to lean towards Elijah, mocking the worshipers of Baal. What's wrong with God? Did he take a nap? Is he on a long journey somewhere? The sanctuary answers that question. But when you say, oh, no, 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 everything that needed to be done was done at the cross, and I'm not diminishing the cross, as we'll see. There's no explanation for what's happening now. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and the work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be, what's the word? Impossible, Impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time. Let me pause there. Who is our faith in? What kind of faith can I have in Jesus if I don't know what Jesus is doing? If I don't know where he is, if I don't know what's my faith in, it's not some nebulous Jesus, it's not a storybook Jesus, it's a real Jesus doing a real thing right now. And unless we know what that is, it will be impossible for us to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs us to fill. Important subject, wouldn't you say? 
So let's talk about this subject of the sanctuary. By God's grace, we can bring some clarity to this. I'd like you to start with me in the book of Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in the book of Hebrews today. You heard from Pastor Thomas that I work in the Sabbath school department, and so I'm fairly involved in adult Sabbath school. My director, Pastor Cameron DeVazier, and I do a weekly program that gives a, a, a that basically teaching tips for the Sabbath school quarterly lesson. We started the year this year with the lesson on Hebrews. Hebrews is a fascinating book. Seventh-day Adventist should regularly thank God for the view we have of Christ in Hebrews. A view shared in no other book the way that it is there. Now, I'm just zeroing in on something, one verse here, because we're going to come back to this. But I want you to notice as the Apostle Paul describes the sanctuary, the temple, he says in verse 9, and I'm reading in the New King James Version here this morning, it was symbolic. I think the King James says a figure. Is that right? It was symbolic. It was a figure for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who offered them perfect, I'm sorry, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods, drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. It was symbolic. It was a figure. What I find fascinating here is the Greek word in the original that's translated figure or symbolic or whatever else your translation may say. And that Greek word is the word parabole. Parabole. Now I'll give you one guess what the English, the regular, let me not say regular. In this passage, it's translated figure or symbolic. Where do you th how do you think it's translated in most of the places in the New Testament? Parable. One guess. Parable. Parable. Dead on. What is a parable? You can say a story with a point, right? A story with an object lesson. This is not accidental that the Apostle Paul, when looking at the sanctuary service, called it a parable. Now, you're Bible students. You, uh, you've done a little bit of searching and studying on the sanctuary, I'm sure. What would you say the sanctuary is a parable of? Okay, I heard somebody say plan of redemption. Would you agree with that? You call it plan of salvation, plan of redemption, right? Isn't that what the sanctuary is about? Those animal sacrifices pointed forward to the great sacrifice of Christ, dying for our sins and and then the, the ministering of his blood in the sanctuary. The sanctuary is a parable of the plan of redemption. I want to think about this for a minute. Try to expand your horizons a little bit. What all is included in the plan of redemption? What's the first most obvious thing that the plan of redemption is about? The cross is, what do you think of? My salvation, right? Personal salvation. Is my personal salvation, is your personal salvation the entirety of the plan of redemption? Is that everything that's accomplished in the plan of redemption? Can't be. Because there's a, before I needed saved, and before anybody else needed saved, there was a problem. Where did the problem begin? In heaven. Who did it begin with? Talking about it in class this morning with Lucifer. And what did Lucifer do? He rebelled against God. He rebelled against God's law. He rebelled against God's government. So when I accept Jesus and I'm saved, that doesn't in and of itself take care of the rebellion of Lucifer, does it? So taking care of the rebellion of Lucifer has to be part of the plan of redemption, doesn't it? You know, even, and, and people don't think this through. The Bible says that Lucifer was so cunning, he took a third of those sinless angels with him who sided with him when he left. But there was another two-thirds, listen to me carefully, who did not have all their questions answered. 
but stayed on God's side by faith, trusting he was the one that they needed to follow. There are angels who have questions that yet need answered. So the plan of redemption, in addition to saving lost people, also has to, well, we didn't even talk about this. When I'm, how many of you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Amen. So when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you passed from death to life. And you can say, John assures us in 1 John chapter 5, he who has the Son has life. I have eternal life in Christ. Amen. How many of you, no, I don't, want to, I don't want to show up hands here, but I'm going to ask a question. How many of you still commit sin? Is it possible for a person who's accepted Christ as a Savior to still fall into sin? Yeah. Folks, that's not going to be happening up there. And so somewhere sin has to be gotten rid of. Some, somewhere sin has to be done away with. So the plan of redemption, in addition to that salvation I experienced when I accept Jesus, in addition to that, somewhere at some point sin has to be wiped out. Amen. That's part of the plan of redemption. God's not going to have sin in the new earth. There's not going to be sin contaminating the universe. It's contaminated this planet. So the plan of redemption, in addition to saving lost people, in addition to getting rid of sin in God's universe, must also answer the questions that may exist in the mind of all created beings about God's goodness, fairness, and justice that Lucifer messed up when he started spreading lies. Like, all of that is in the package. This is what Jesus said. Now turn with me to John chapter 12. This is what Jesus meant in John 12. A lot of people miss this in John 12, verse 31. John 12, verse 31 and 32. Again, reading in the New King James Version, it says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw what? Now, my Bible says all peoples to myself. Some said all men. Is there anything that looks different in the typeface in that verse? The word peoples is italicized. The word men is italicized, depending on your translation. What does it mean? Do you know what it means when it's italicized? It's been supplied by the translators. It's not in the original. If you're reading the original, Jesus would simply say, I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all to myself. You say, what's the significance of that? Go to Colossians with me, chapter 1. First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians, chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Notice the words of the apostle. Speaking of Christ, he says, First, Col uh, first Colossians, Colossians, chapter 1, and verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile. What does reconcile mean? Bring back together, right? To reconcile, notice what he says, all things to himself by him, whether things on what? Earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Jesus said there are yet things in heaven that need to be reconciled. This is pointing to those questions that may exist in the minds of heavenly beings. Let's look at the testimony of two witnesses here. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Back a few pages to your left, right after Galatians. Ephesians 3, and notice verse 10. In fact, I need to back up a little in Paul's sentence here. Notice verse 8. He says, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach the, among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which has from the beginning, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now, don't miss this, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by who? That's who's that? That's you and me. To the principalities and powers where? In the heavenly places. 
simple point I'm trying to make here is that the plan of redemption even reaches beyond this planet. The universe has been tainted with the rebellion of Lucifer. All of that needs to be dealt with, and Jesus Christ is dealing with it. Can you say amen to that? Amen. He didn't limit it, and I praise the Lord for personal salvation. But I tell you, I also am looking forward to the time when my sins have been blotted out. Amen. And when there's nothing in me that the devil can find a foothold in. Amen. So, the plan of redemption includes all of these things. The, the, the uh, 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 effect it's had on the universe at large it's what we, the Seventh-day Adventists, call the Great Controversy. Like, all of th this whole Great Controversy picture is in the plan of redemption. Now, why am I going here? This is what I want to share with you. When the Apostle Paul says that the sanctuary is a parable of the plan of salvation, then we should expect to see everything I just mentioned in the sanctuary. And we do. We do, and we will. That's what we're going to be thinking about here as I walk through. Now, what I want to do first, what I have to do first, is walk through the typical sanctuary service. What was being communicated in this service? There were two main components of the service. Incidentally, you've heard the terms type and anti-type, right? The earthly sanctuary, we often call it a type. It was a model. It wasn't the real thing. God doesn't dwell in tents made with hands. We can look at other scriptures like that. And so I put the, so this is the type. This is a, like a hot wheel or something. For me personally, in fact, Brother Jay, you made a note of this. I think you were maybe mildly confessing this morning. He talked about having fast cars with loud motors for the midlife crisis. And I thought, <laughs> Jay's doing a little confessing this morning. For me, I'll confess with you. For me, I would like the anti-type, okay? That, that's the car. This is the model. As Seventh-day Adventists, when we talk about the sanctuary, let's not forget that the earthly sanctuary in the blood of bulls and goats was the model. It wasn't the car. And that's what we're going to try to expound on as we get further into this. But we have to start with the model because the Lord started with the model. He gave us the model of the earthly tabernacle. And what I want to do is I want to just walk through the basics. And when I say the basics, if you've done study in the subject of the sanctuary, and you've gone through, plotted through the book of Leviticus, I mean, there are multiple sacrifices involved in the sanctuary. There are multiple animals that can be chosen. There are thank offerings. There are peace offerings. There are whole burnt offerings. There are trespass offerings and sin offerings and vow offerings, lots of different things, but they all were communicating the same basic idea. Uh, and let me rephrase that. They all communicated different parts of the broader idea. We're going to be looking at the basic concept of what the sin offering was, because that's what it was built around. The sanctuary is, is God showing us how he's dealing with this great controversy, how he's going to deal with sin. Now, let's start. Here's a... Here's a Artist rendition of the earthly tabernacle, the wilderness tabernacle. Of course, later they built temples and they were bigger and bigger. But they still had the same basic design. They had the most holy place. They had the holy place. Those are the two apartments in the sanctuary itself. The holy place was twice as big as the most holy place. You had the courtyard area where you see the wash basin, right? You have a priest there. And then you have the altar of burnt offering. And then you had the fence around... Uh, the sanctuary in that courtyard area. I want you to notice, <laughs> if you have two rooms and you call one room a holy room and one the most holy room, where's the attention kind of being drawn to? <laughs> now, when you hear most holy, there's something being communicated there. And not by accident. Uh, this, I don't have time to get into. I I'd love to do, in fact, I'm ab about to do a uh, weekend with our high school students and we're going to talk about the law of God in five presentations. Uh, there, we've, we've missed a whole lot on the law of God. Seventh-day Adventists, you can't. In fact, I was telling a minister about it, and I had to apologize. This is where we are as Adventists. It's like, what are you going to do? The, 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 the minister wanted to do a theme for the weekend, and he said, we've picked the theme, Pastor Thomas. We've called it the thread. 
What's the thread throughout Scripture? And, of course, he'd suggested that there's, you know, the love of God. I won't argue with that. There's, you know, Jesus. We could just say Jesus is the thread running throughout Scripture. But as I thought about it and I prayed about it, in the context of where we are, the thread that I saw is the law of God. Ellen White tells us in the book Great Controversy that the last conflict is only the long-standing, the end of the long-standing controversy over the law of God. That's where it started in the beginning. But, but as I communicated this to a Seventh-day Adventist minister, I had to explain and apologize. That's where we are today. It's like, you know, I'm going to talk about the law. But hold on, it won't be legalistic. You hear what I'm saying? Like we can't, like we can't even talk about the law anymore. Oh, don't. Are you trying to say we're saved by the law? No. You know how we do it? We have to do all these apologies and explanations and caveats and it, it phrases and, you know, parenthetical introductions and sidesteps. And, but if you look at the sanctuary, why is the most holy place the most holy place? Now, hold on. If you're tempted to say, well, because that's where the Shekinah dwelt, hold your horses, time permitting, and I'm not going to do this this morning, the Shekinah was all through the sanctuary both apartments. God was not limited to the sanctuary in one apartment. He would meet with Moses at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. That's right out here. It was not the presence of God, although the presence of God is what makes things holy, but the attention is being drawn to as somebody has once said, the rock's in the box. You've got the Ark of the Atonement, or the Ark of the Covenant, rather, in the most holy place, and inside that Ark was what? The Ten Commandment Law of God. Now, on top of that Ark of the Covenant was something called the what? Okay, you guys know your sanctuary, the mercy seat. And it was above the mercy seat, between the cherubim, that when the Lord would dwell in the sanctuary, he would come and his presence would be there. Amen. Now, if God is seated on something, it's called a seat, and you're seated on it, and it's God seated on it, what is that a picture of? His throne. And what's underneath it? Now, now think about this for a minute. What's underneath any king's throne? Like, what's the foundation of a king's throne. It's his laws, right? It's what he governs by. It's no different in the sanctuary. But this, the reason I'm telling you this is the sanctuary is trying to communicate to us that in this parable picture, right in the heart of everything, you have the throne of God. Established on the law of God. There's only one problem, and it's a big problem. His law was challenged. Amen. Why is there even a sanctuary service to begin with? So people can bring sin offerings. What's sin? It's transgression of God's law. If there was never a sin, there would be no need for the sanctuary. Okay, this is all being communicated in this imagery that God's law was challenged. That's what sin is. It's rebellion against God's law. And so, right in the heart of the sanctuary, you have the law of God, and all of sacrifices were because that law was broken. Now, I'm going to tell you, and you're going to see this as we go on, that I believe that the sanctuary is representative of the government of God. Amen. Representative of the government of God. You'll understand what I mean as we go on here. Now, you had these different apartments in the sanctuary, and I want to have that foundation as we begin to look at the service of the sanctuary. The basic service of the sanctuary is broken up into two components, right? There were two apartments in the sanctuary, the holy place and the most holy. And corresponding to each apartment, there was a service. For the holy place, there was a service that went on daily throughout the year. For the most holy place, there was one service one time a year called the Day of Atonement service. And they're linked together. So let's talk about the daily service for a moment. In the daily service, I've got an aerial view here. If you can't make it out, you've got the Ark of the Covenant over here. You've got the altar of incense over this way. You've got the table of showbread. I should have my pointer. You have the lampstands and, of course, the courtyard. When a person, as God gave this instruction, when a person committed a sin... That person was to take a sacrificial animal and bring that animal 
to the sanctuary. When they got to the door of the sanctuary, there would be a priest there to meet them, to instruct them, to guide them in the service. The first thing the priest would tell a person to do for a sin offering was to lay their hands on the head of the sacrificial animal. And, and let me say this, um, if you've done studying this, you realize that, you know, we always have this kind of this gingerly laying on hands, but in the actual service, they were to bear down with their weight on that animal, oftentimes a big person just knocking the animal to the ground. And they were to confess their sins. Now that, that little picture was a picture of that person who sinned taking the innocent animal and transferring their sinfulness to the animal and exchanging that for the sinlessness of the animal. Right? Because the person who sinned, according to the Lord, the wages of sin is death. The soul that sins shall die. I'm worthy of death, but when I bring that animal and confess my sins on that animal and transfer, what happens is we trade places. Now, I grew up with a big brother, and my big brother liked to trade stuff. Anybody have a big brother? You ever have a big brother try to trade you stuff? He sees, he eyes something you have that he likes. He's like, hey, listen, I've got, I'll trade you. You know, my brother would have these things, junk stuff laying around. It's like, I got these three things for your one thing. And in your young mind, you're thinking three for one. Who, that's a great deal, right? It's like, it's like when you get a little kid and you've got a real shiny penny and they have a dull silver dollar and you're like, I'll give you this shiny penny for that dull silver dollar. Okay. Anyway, I had some bad trades, but this is a good trade, right? This is where the sinner comes with no merit, with no, no, deserving nothing, no favor, and yet through that sacrifice, the sacrificial animal takes the sin of the sinner, and the sinner takes the righteousness of the animal. And because the animal takes upon itself the sin of the sinner, now the animal has to die. And so after that confession, after that transfer, the priest hands the knife to you and instructs you to cut the throat of the animal and catch the blood in a basin. I know, it's, uh, it can, it's, 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 to some it's unsettling. Some of you may be hunters and you're the, it should be unsettling though. And then what would happen is the animal would be cut in pieces and put upon the altar. The blood of the animal would be taken, incidentally, that death of the animal, in case you hadn't put the two together, is Calvary. And folks, there is, it, Ellen White says to, to, to remove the cross from the Christian would be to like to blot the sun out of the sky. So we are not diminishing the cross of Calvary. But that was not the entirety of the service. That's just how it started. Because, because there's a, the animal sacrifice, but there's, and who did the who animal sacrifice represent? Christ. But there's another player in here. And that's called the priest. And who did the priest represent? Ah, the priest also represented Christ. So don't tell me to talk about the work of the high priest as diminishing Christ. That's the work of Christ, our great heavenly high priest. And after the sinner sacrificed the animal, the blood was taken by the priest into the sanctuary. Now, there were different ways of disposing of this. There are some variations of this. But this is the basic idea, that the blood was taken into the sanctuary. What did that mean? Leviticus 17, 11, the Lord is, he's instructing in the service, says the life of the flesh is in the blood. So when the sinner confessed the sin over the head of the animal and transferred the sin to the animal, then when the blood was taken, because of the sin, that blood was tainted with the sin of the sinner. I know we're, we're tempted right away to say, well, that... 
would have been, Jesus represented the lamb, and so that blood would have been representative of a, the pure life of Christ. Not so. It was the pure life of Christ until he traded places. Then you went away free with the pure life of Christ, and he died for your sins. And the picture here, from a practical standpoint, is clear. When you come to Jesus, that doesn't mean all your problems are worked out, right? But what it does mean is you finally come to a point where you say, I can't do this myself. Lord, you've got to do this for me. And so as the priest, he steps in and he takes that blood representing your frail, sinful life, and he says, I'm going to fix this. That's what's being typified here. As he takes that blood into the sanctuary, the sin is transferred figuratively to the sanctuary. People talk about the cleansing of the, cleansing of the sanctuary. And I have a peop- I've had people say, oh yeah, they went and scrubbed everything down. It's not about the blood. It's about what's symbolized in the blood. The sin of the sinner was transferred there. In other words, God now took responsibility for the life of all who trusted in him. Jesus, as the high priest, has taken responsibility. Your sin's not canceled out. You could have come to the sanctuary because you got a fight with your neighbor, and then you could have confessed your sin, traded places, killed the lamb, gone away, forgiven and free, and punched your neighbor in the mouth next week. You know it's true. And, and, and so who takes responsibility for that? The Lord says, I'm not done with him yet. I'm not done with her yet. It's transferred to the sanctuary. This was the service that went on day after day, all through the year. In the words of uh, Ellen White, she says in Great Controversy, a substitute was accepted in the sinner's stead or place, but the sin was not canceled by the blood of the victim. That's simply saying that I still have a heart that needs transformed. There's still sin that needs to be dealt with, but I don't have to worry about it because of the one who's dealing with it. The sin was not canceled out by the blood of the victim. A means was thus provided by which it was transferred to the sanctuary. But he was not yet entirely released from the condemnation of the law. Why? Because I can go and punch my neighbor in the mouth again. Because I still have thoughts I shouldn't have or whatever it happens to be. But you know my favorite word in this statement is that little word yet. What that tells us is there's a time coming. Where God's people, and we're told this in inspiration, where God's people will not even be able to recall their sins to mind. Even though they have a deep sense of unworthiness, even though they know it's not their own merits, they're not the reason for it. Yet try as they might, they can't bring the sins to remembrance because they've gone beforehand to judgment and been blotted out. That's what was typified in the rest of the service. So if you grew up in that Hebrew economy, day in and day out, you're offering animal sacrifices when you commit sin. There were daily offerings going up for the whole camp of Israel, and this would happen on a regular basis. But you knew that unless you participated in the Day of Atonement at the end of the year, and then later they changed it to the beginning of the calendar year. So don't, if you've heard that, it's the same basic idea. The Day of Atonement was cleaning up what had happened all year. You'll see that in a minute. But if you did not part, take part in the Day of Atonement, all that you'd offer during the year didn't count in a, in a, in a, in a sort of way. In other words, you can't, you can't separate the two. They're, they're both parts of the same service. The congregation knew that my sin has been transferred to the sanctuary. Then came the Day of Atonement or at one minute. Incidentally, now, we get into these discussions. I'm going to save it for this afternoon. That discussion of whether atonement was finished at the cross or not, and what does that all mean, and yeah. We're going to, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit this afternoon. The Day of Atonement or at one minute. Now, this was interesting on the Day of Atonement. You have the same basic, we have similarities in the service, but on the Day of Atonement, instead of the one animal sacrifice being brought, what was brought for the people? Two goats right and one was designated as the lord's goat and one was designated as the scapegoat now here's the fascinating part about this that a lot of people miss where all through the year when the animal was brought sin was confessed the sinner's sin was confessed over the head of that animal 
On the Day of Atonement, there was no sin confessed on the head of the scapegoat. Now think about it. That animal comes representing Christ, but when I confess my sins, what happened? I transferred my sin to the animal, and then the blood that's taken represents my sinful life that Jesus, the sin bearer, took for me into the sanctuary temporarily, holding it there, as it were, until the atonement was provided. Amen. On the Day of Atonement, there's no sin confessed over the head of the goat. The goat is slain, the Lord's goat. The blood is taken, now not representing life, uh, a life tainted by sin, but the sinless life of Jesus, our surety. Amen. This is why on the Day of Atonement and no other day, the priest could go right into the most holy place. He wouldn't dare step in there any other day with that blood that represented the sinful life of the victims. But on the Day of Atonement, there's another thing being portrayed here. Now, the priest is carrying what represents the sinless life of Christ. It's taken into the most holy place. The blood is sprinkled, representing the life, on top of the mercy seat. Obviously, there's all kinds of imagery there of the love and the mercy of God in offering the plan of salvation. But another important point is that why would you, why would you sprinkle something that represents life over top of the law? Because, listen, let me, let me ask it this way. The human race has forfeited their right to heaven because they violated the law of God. We're told in inspiration that the same requirement exists today as existed for Adam and Eve, perfect obedience to the law of God. Well, guess what? We don't have that. So where are we going to get that from? That blood was sprinkled over top of the law of God, basically communicating that here is a life that has been found among humanity, because Jesus took our humanity among himself. Here's a life that has been found among humanity that is in perfect harmony with the law of God. This life can now be accepted in the place of all of those other ones that have come trusting that the day would come where one would perfectly be, become that perfect atonement. And so first the blood is taken and sprinkled on the mercy seat. God bears witness as his presence is there, and his glory fills the temple, and that life is found to be in harmony with the law of God. Now, the priest, the high priest on the Day of Atonement, after he sprinkled that blood on the mercy seat, would go out into the holy place, and he would place that blood everywhere the other blood had been placed throughout the year. Now, it, should be, it shouldn't be complicated, but I know there's a lot of details, but basically, you've got the sin transferred in. That's your sin and my sin. Now you've got the perfect life of Jesus coming and covering every place where my life was represented. So you've got the perfect righteousness of Christ now replacing the sinful life of you and me. That was what's communicated in the sanctuary. So the priest would put, would sprinkle that blood, now accepted before the Father, every place where the other blood had been, thus affecting atonement, the day of atonement. And then, that wasn't the end of the service. Then, he would go out of the sanctuary, and now confession was made after atonement had been completed. It's important to keep that in mind. Confession was made over the head of the scapegoat, and the scapegoat was not sacrificed, but sent to die in the wilderness. Now, if you've studied this, you understand that the sending away, that confessing of sin over the head of the I mean, get the picture here. All through the year, the sin is transferred into the sanctuary. Who bears reproach in this world for sin? Who gets blamed for sin? It's not the devil. How many times do you have people say, yeah, I'm just so sick and tired. Why does the devil allow all this stuff to happen? Why does he cause all this trouble? No, it's always God who gets the rap, right? Why does God allow this? Why doesn't he do something? And God bears and has borne reproach for the existence of sin, even though he had nothing to do with it. 
But the time is coming. Through the cleansing of the sanctuary, this, we're looking at the type right now, where the Lord will exonerate himself by cleansing the sin from the sanctuary and finally putting the sin on the head of the scapegoat, the instigator of the whole mess. And he goes out into the wilderness and dies. Now I told you, the great controversy, plan of redemption, it's all here in the sanctuary. It's all typified in the sanctuary. And I might add one other thing. That through... I'll do that in a moment. Let, let, I, I want to I conclude this morning by looking at a couple more passages. First, to, let's go to the book of Leviticus. Now, Leviticus 16 is the Day of Atonement chapter. And I apologize. I would have liked to just go through the passages in Scripture, but we would have been here for three weeks. You know, we've been going through the book of Leviticus and going through every sacrifice. We're just trying to give a, an overview which will allow us to dive into the Scripture in the book of Hebrews this afternoon. But in the book of, Levit in the book of Leviticus, num uh, chapter 16, we're going to pick up in verse 30. Now, the whole chapter is dealing with the Day of Atonement. But I want you to see something here in this chapter. Leviticus 16, verse 30. And, and I'm going to ask you up front, so watch as we're going through the passage. This is the question I want you to answer. What two things were cleansed on the Day of Atonement? What two things were cleansed on the Day of Atonement? Verse 30. For on that day, the priest shall make atonement for you, to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated to minister as priest in his father's place shall make atonement and put on the linen clothes, the holy garments. Then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary. And he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting and for the altar. And he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. Now you see both things there in that last verse. What are the two things that are cleansed? All right, the people and the sanctuary. Now, hang on to this. I remember the first time this dawned on me, I thought, wait a minute now. Like, all my study of the sanctuary was always about the people, right? I mean, that's what the cleansing of the sanctuary is, cleansing the people from their sin. What's the big deal with the building? Like, once the people are cleansed, why do we got to worry about the building? The sins of the people went into the building, right? But that's been taken care of. Why the building? What did I say the sanctuary represented? Government. The government of God. See, when personal salvation is affected, there's still those questions. And what God is trying to say is in the cleansing of the sanctuary, through the cleansing of his people, he's also going to cleanse the reputation, if it, as you will of his government that through the cleansing of his people he is going to demonstrate his justice to the universe and in this work of the cleansing of the sanctuary everything is going to be made right Amen. now this is the type right this is the hot wheel car but brothers and sisters let me be clear to you we are not living in a type we are living in the anti-type the antitypical Day of Atonement. In fact, I, ha I, I can't help but think that this is what the Apostle John was thinking of when he wrote 1 John chapter 3. I want to conclude here with just a couple verses. One is on the screen, one is here, one is here in 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 1. Some of you might want to start singing. I suppose that'd be fine. First John chapter 3, verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Hallelujah. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. 
Beloved, now don't miss this. Now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, what's that talking about? The second coming of Christ. When he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. You know, the Bible says without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And what John is saying is, we don't know what that looks like. You ever have those debates? I mean, I don't, I don't want to show hands here. You know those debates we have at Seventh-day Adventists like, but how perfect can you really be in this life? And we get into these big discussions. Who knows what it looks like? Let me just be clear with you. I don't have any question that Jesus Christ can cleanse me from every ounce of sin. Amen. Don't ask me how he's going to do it. Don't ask me to explain the dynamics of it. I think this is what John is saying. We know. We don't know what it looks like. We can't explain all the ins and outs, but we know that we're going to see him as he is, and without holiness, no man will see the Lord. And if that's the case then we know we're going to be like him when he comes. And he finishes up by saying, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. This is the time we're living in, the antitypical day of atonement. We, as those people in ancient Israel, afflicted their souls. We come before God and ask God, is there anything in my heart that's between me and you? What a time to be alive. Brothers and sisters, it's a powerful time to be alive, and I would like to say more, but, you know, I told you this is two parts, one sermon. I want to finish with this text in Hebrews 10 and verse 4. We're talking about the type, the hot wheel car. It's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. It's not possible the blood of goats. That was pointing us forward to a practical reality this afternoon I want to get into what this means for us in our daily walk with Jesus. What does that look like? Living in this world at this time, not only wanting to be ready for the coming of Christ ourselves, but helping others to be ready for that day. How many, want to, how many of you want to be ready when Jesus comes again? How many want to say today, you want to live today like somebody who looks like they're waiting for Jesus to come again? Is that your desire? Let's pray together. Father in heaven. Father, as we have reflected on this powerful typology that you've given us through the sanctuary service, as we meditate upon the possibilities, not just for us, but for all humanity, as we meditate upon the time that we're living in, I pray your Holy Spirit would search and try our hearts and move, Lord, move upon us. Show us those things, those places, those ways that our lives are not in harmony with your will. Where our lives are not bringing honor to your name. The whole universe is watching and the time is at hand when the cleansing of your people is going to bring glory and honor to your government, to your holy name. I pray, Lord, that we would be among those faithful. Bless us now, Lord, this afternoon, into this afternoon. Bless us as we fellowship together, and bless us as we return to study your word, for we ask and pray these things in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Now, I thought an appropriate hymn to respond with today would be number 294, Power in the Blood. So I'm going to ask if you would stand together while we sing.
Father in heaven, as we go now to our luncheon and fellowship time, may we hold fast the things that we have been taught from your word. Thank you for giving us such precious promises as an end to sin, both for our lives and also in the universe. Grant us, Lord, the patience while you work it out and the faith to know that you will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. As we are dismissed, we want to remind those of you who are on our viewing, our viewing audience that this next service at 3 o'clock Eastern Time will be broadcast as well. So we invite you to return to this same channel that you're watching us on at 3 p.m. May the Lord bless you as you have a wonderful lunch together.